it is time. It is time. It is time for uh, the horrible part. It's time for the part that nobody wants to talk about, and also everybody wants to talk about. There might be some Kleenex. I don't know. You can cry if you want to. Um, <laughs> you can give them to me and I'll throw them like a t-shirt. You, you can Good plan. Uh, okay, so hi. Uh, my name is Lucy Bellwood. I am really excited to be here. It's my first time in Missouri. And um, someone corrected me at the bank before I left, and they were like, you can't say that. You have to say Missouri, or else people will get mad at you. It's like, it's the Midwest. I don't think they're going to get mad at me. <laughs> Um, so I am a little loopy, I have to apologize. I got in at about 12.45 last night and then Thanks. stayed up until uh, whenever making slides and then got up early this morning. So I'm on like five hours of sleep and several cups of tea. But hopefully this will be informative. It's gonna be a lot of information. Uh, be gentle with yourselves <laughs> as we delve into this terrifying subject. Um, because I really love talking about money and since it seems like uh, folks are a little curious about background, uh, I figured I would talk about some of the things that I've done in my career, uh, how I've ended up where I am today. And um, this is, I, I did have a bit at the start of this talk about how we were front-loading all the difficult stuff, so this afternoon would be easy. But later today, I'm gonna talk more broadly about definitions of success in creative careers, which is also going to be emotional and rather difficult. So I'm just sorry, I'm the, I'm the difficult presenter. Uh, so my, um, background is not in, I mean, I've been making comics for almost 10 years now, but uh, I grew up in Southern California and the child of two English immigrants, um, and I really like being outside. Uh, this is me in the Grand Canyon on a whitewater rafting expedition, and this is me in my uh, first job as a replica tall ship sailor, um, which is the closest thing to a real job I've ever had. <laughs> So I, I wanted to put these images up because uh, I primarily make autobiographical comics that are nonfiction, uh, and coming from a, an outdoorsy background, really liking to be in the world, there's something that these occupations and drawing comics do not have in common, which is that typically drawing comics means sitting on your butt at a desk indoors for years at a stretch and never seeing the sun. And so I really, uh, when I started making comics, I wanted to tell stories about the things that I do and that I'm passionate about. And I, it took many years. I went through many different permutations. I started, I started out calling myself a dual citizen tall ship sailing cartoonist. I think America's only dual citizen tall ship sailing cartoonist. <laughs> then a cartoonist who goes on adventures, then a tall ship sailing cartoonist. And I kind of bounced back and forth until I arrived at uh, adventure cartoonist. And I really appreciated what Colleen said earlier about having the right log line. This is the, adventure cartoonist is the snakes on a plane of career titles. Because I tell people, and the, the distinction was immediate, when I used to say, well, I make comics about going on adventures with big boats and other stuff, people would be into it, but not really clear about what it was that I did. When I say I'm an adventure cartoonist, they still don't know what it is that I do, but they want to buy everything I have ever produced, which is very helpful <laughs> for marketing purposes. <laughs> so I think, uh, I, I bring this up as an example because, you know, it's, it's sometimes a hard enough struggle to call yourself a real writer or a real artist. And uh, this is in the description for this talk that uh, people tend to get really hung up when it comes to money, especially on are you legit? Are you the real deal? Is it when you have a book published? Is it when you make $100,000? Is it when you uh, get a New York Times bestseller status? Do you get a star review in Publishers Weekly? Like, what is it? What defines that feeling? Um, so, we're going to talk about that more this afternoon. But um, a little bit of background this is my first graphic novel. Uh, it's called Baggy Wrinkles A Lover's Guide to Life at Sea. It is available. Um, I do enjoy that I've watched people in the room buy books by each presenter. It's like you're all waiting. You want to wait and make sure that none of us bomb. I'm, like, I'm not going to buy this until I know this person is good. And so first people all got Ben's books, and then they all went and got Colleen's books. So hopefully, crossing my fingers, you'll go buy mine. Um, Baggy Wrinkles was produced and uh, funded on Kickstarter, so I am a big uh, proponent of crowdfunding, which I will talk about um, using Kickstarter and Patreon to finance a creative career. And my second graphic novel, which is also available at the back, is uh, called 100 Demon Dialogues, which is not really to do with adventures at all. It's a project about dealing with self-doubt and imposter syndrome and anxiety and uh, how to make friends with your inner critic. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview um, because I think this is very valuable, right? You see, oh, this person has published two books. How successful. And this is a long con, right? Making it as a creative person takes a long time. So 
Um, I went to college from 2009 to about 2012. Uh, I did a workshop at the Center for Cartoon Studies in 2010, which is a graduate program specifically for comics in White River Junction, Vermont. And they have a great uh, five to 10 day intro to comics workshop with a variety of skill levels and great instructors. If you're looking to get into drawing comics and want like an intensive place to go do that thing with a very practical <coughs> skill set, it's a great option. When I came back to Portland, which is where I went to college, um, I also did a certificate program at a local place called the IPRC, the Independent Publishing Resource Center. And they had a sort of low residency master's program, again, for comics and independent publishing. So I was steeping a lot in this underground zine stir community of like, DIY, do it on the photocopier when your boss isn't looking, like make it in your bedroom, hand sew all your mini comics, Colleen, I see you. Um, and I ended up doing a thesis project, actually, for my undergrad uh, degree that was a 36-page comic. It was my first long-form comic. And uh, my thesis advisor recommended, I wanted to publish it, the department was not going to pay me to print a commercial edition of the project. And this was, 2012 Kickstarter was still a pretty new proposition, and so I thought, ah, what the heck, I'll run a Kickstarter during the last three weeks of my undergraduate career. What could possibly go wrong? It turns out that's the worst time to run a Kickstarter. It was very stressful, and I don't know how I survived. But I raised almost $12,000 to print this thing, which was an incredibly fortuitous and heady experience because it launched me into a full-time freelance career straight out of college. And I have been completely independent ever since. I want to point out, this is no more or less legitimate than any other path to success. I am not on the train of, like, you're not legit unless you're indie, because that's garbage, and it doesn't serve anybody. But just to let you know, this is kind of how my perspective comes from how do I balance my finances in order to stay afloat and not uh, have to sacrifice being able to go on big boats or raft through the Grand Canyon or do the other stuff. I became an intern at a local studio in Portland called Periscope, uh, now Helioscope, which is a collective of about 28 freelance comics professionals from all across the industry, wide variety, and eventually became a member uh, a couple years later because I refused to leave. Um, and <laughs> Then after I'd been at Periscope for a while, uh, I ran a second Kickstarter to fund Baggy Wrinkles. So that, uh, you can see, there's a big numerical jump there. And all along that period of time, from the first to the second, I had been putting out chapters of the book as little black and white, hand-sewn mini-comics. And we're gonna talk about this, like building demand in your audience so that when you give them something to buy, they are primed, they are excited about it. Kickstarter functions very well when you have groundswell behind you. And so all of this time that I'd been dedicating, you know, from right at that first CCS workshop, I was going to comics festivals, I was meeting people. And in fact, uh, joining social media, right? Here's a quick timeline of all the different platforms that I got on. I joined Twitter in 2009, it's almost 10 years. Uh, <laughs> I had a WordPress blog in 2010, I made a Facebook page begrudgingly in 2011. I joined Instagram in 2012, that's been okay. Uh, Tumblr, which is sort of now, um, and Medium, which, uh, the problem with social media is that it keeps changing, and I'm a very reactionary person. I like working on old ships from the 18th century. It's like I can't deal with the rate of technological progress today. Um, but there, it's, it's a good reminder that we all kind of have to keep up with a certain amount of technology. And actually, the biggest challenge for me has been learning what to let go when I realize it's not serving me anymore. Um, so in this time, here's the number of conventions I was going to uh, per year. Um, started out with just one, then it was two, then it was six, then it was nine, then it was six again, then it was eight. And this is uh, conventions all around the country, right? Traveling hither and thither and yon. Um, my travel budget is moderately substantial, although I travel on the cheap. And uh, at every one of those shows, you are meeting people. And a lot of them, you're going back to the same shows. And so crucially, as Colleen pointed out, you're meeting the same people. And a lot of building a career in comics really just feels like it's about demonstrating that you are not a flash in the pan. You are still showing up. And that shows editors, it shows uh, publishers, that even without them, you're continuing to put out new short stories, right? New little gifts. I have people who come visit me at conventions now, and every year they come by, they say, hey, I made a new mini comic. Could I give you a copy? And it's the best strategy, um, especially because, as Colleen mentioned, at cons, like your brain is so addled that a business card isn't going to cut it. But a comic, a gift from somebody, we'll talk about gifts a little bit later, um, really makes an impression and sticks with you. OK, but we're not done yet. Uh, so again, first book, Baggy Wrinkles, came out in 2016. 
I was approached by a publisher who was interested in expanding it, but I panicked because I was like, I don't know, I don't want to get into bed with the first person who asked me to the dance. <laughs> and so um, I acquired an agent uh, on the strength of having a book that I had put out myself that a publisher was interested in. Um, I participated in the 100 Day Project for the first time, which will become important anon. It is do a creative thing every day for 100 days. I'm very into practices, the creative practice over time, so this will come back. Um, also did seven conventions that year. Uh, also at the end of 2016, I spoke at a festival called XOXO, which is a conference for independent people making work on the internet in Portland. And it was a really crucial turning point for me for reasons I'll go into in the success talk, but essentially I got up on stage in front of 800 people and told them that all of my success was a lie. Uh, and that went over super well and um, changed my life. So definitely be very vulnerable about everything horrible that is going on in your world. Uh, in 2017, I did my second 100-day project, which became 100 Demon Dialogues. That book was drawn one page at a time over three and a half months. Um, and when it was finished, I ran a Kickstarter for that book. And again, priming an audience to want to purchase the completed edition of that thing led to a Kickstarter that was more successful than the previous one. Um, and I had enough money to not only print books, but also produce uh, little demon plush toys, which feels like success to me. It's very exciting. And then in 2018, I did eight sort of actual conventions. Um, oh, the end of that year, I, I gave another talk at Creative Mornings. I do like public speaking quite a lot. Uh, the book actually came out for real. And then I did an enormous book tour. Uh, I was gone 270 days out of last year. I am so tired still, uh, which is also an important thing to talk about when we talk about creative seasons. So anyway, lots of traveling, lots of talking to people, lots of uh, progressing slowly towards bigger goals. Because people talked about social media, I'm going to just quickly run down some things that I think are valuable to have as you embark on uh, wanting to build a sustainable career and tell other people that you want to get paid for the work that you do. Um, there's a lot of power, it turns out, in telling people what you want to have happen. Uh, so having your own website is very helpful. Uh, as Colleen mentioned, like the, the number of times I want to hire someone to do something and all I can find is their Twitter and like, I guess I'm supposed to send them a DM, oh, but their account is locked and you can't actually, it's like, make it easy, make it easy for everyone to hire you. So have your own website, have a professional email address, not, um, I don't know, bumburglar27 at Hotmail, right? Like, no one uses Hotmail, get out of there. Uh, <laughs> professional email address, easily readable. Um, have a bio, and for the love, do not call yourself an aspiring person. No matter how illegitimate and terrified you feel, I still feel like an aspiring cartoonist. But the fact of the matter is I am drawing comics, I am thinking about stories, I am trying to make this my livelihood. So even if it takes breaking out in a cold sweat and running around and just like jogging in circles in your room for half an hour, just write, so-and-so is a writer living in <laughs> um, or a cartoonist living in <laughs> No one's gonna check. Uh, no one has ever asked me where I went to school, what my degree is in, it's great. I could, I could be a total shyster, nobody would know. Um, having a Twitter page is good for certain things. Different social media platforms benefit us in different ways. Twitter gets a lot of bad press right now because it's kind of a hellhole. Uh, that is legit. If you don't want to be there, you don't have to be there. Nothing is more of a turnoff than an author who clearly does not want to be on a social media platform and has been strong-armed by their publisher into talking about, uh, my book, I guess, bye. Um, <laughs> And it's like, I get it, so self-promotion is so hard. But Twitter can just be a place that you go to congratulate other people. Like, think about it as your winner circle of getting to go see what publishers are excited about, see what they're talking about. You can mute your friends, they will never know. Uh, I have lots of people in the industry I really respect who I cannot look at on Twitter. Um, but it's a good place to have those sort of one-off, like Colleen said, you're just faving somebody's thing, you're leaving a comment, you're letting them know that you're there, you're paying doesn't have to be your whole life. Um, Instagram for visual creators is pretty good. I feel like it's kind of ascending as the space where most cartoonists are sharing stuff. Um, as been demonstrated, like you can have little square panel comics that people can swipe through. Uh, 100 Demon Dialogues probably gave most of its success because it was on Instagram, and it was part of the 100 Day Project hashtag, which kind of became its own micro community. So there's some utility there. Um, a professional Facebook page, I have to admit that there are people who still use Facebook like it's the whole internet. There is some benefit there. I have complicated feelings about it, and I'm probably, I don't know, I'm on the fence about deleting my Facebook page. The thing that Facebook is good for that most other places are not is events. 
And when I did my enormous tour, I did find it helpful to have a tour blog where you could go and visit um, all the dates in one place. And then maybe like niche community spaces, you know, maybe you're part of a subreddit for people who are really into tall ship sailing. And like obviously those people are gonna want to read your book about tall ship sailing. So you know your own demographics the best if you're if you're writing about your actual life. And in terms of what to put out there, like social media is just curation. You're gonna find the things that appeal to you, things that you get excited about, and share those, because chances are there are other people in the world who get excited about those things also. Um, sarcasm and negativity are really difficult to read on the internet, so maybe just be nice. I don't know, <laughs> uh, it works for me. Um, my grand unified theory of the internet uh, and how it actually does make the world better, I promise, it's not all awful. Um, is that when you put yourself online, you're essentially saying, I am here and I exist. And this has two potential paths of action, right? There is social resonance, where other people say, oh my gosh, I feel that way too. And then there is also social awareness, where people say, wow, I had no idea that experience even existed. I was having a conversation with a friend recently um, about the fact that both of us have become much better allies to trans people in our lives because we follow people on the internet. Maybe we don't even know them who are trans and who are talking about their life experience. And I grew up in a pretty vanilla town. Uh, there was not a lot of diversity there. And the internet has really made me a better person, even though it is full of trash fires, because there are a lot of brave people who are willing to talk about what it is like to exist as themselves in the world. So there is value in that, both for you to talk about your own experience and find your tribe, and for other people to maybe learn something along the way. You don't owe it to anyone to educate them, but it can help. So that leads to reassurance that we're not alone, which is huge, that's like the stuff that communities and life are built of, um, and exposure to new voices, and both of those things create social change. I'm gonna get off my soapbox now, we're done with this. Uh, there's a blank slide next, I don't know what it is. Oh good, the money, okay, so yes, uh, now we're gonna talk about making money from comics. So we're gonna make comics, we're gonna do something else, and then we're gonna profit. Um, all right, we're gonna start with a fun fact. Um, people really hate talking about money. I don't know about what the Midwest culture is like for this, but uh, generally pretty much all over, people just don't like it. It is a subject that is consistently ranked highest on the lists of things that people don't wanna talk about with other human beings, and that list also includes things like politics, and religion, and death, and their favorite uh, bedroom position. Um, so just like know that if you feel uncomfortable about this, take a deep breath. And just recognize that we're gonna be a little, a little messy and a little vulnerable. Um, it's not hard to understand why we have conflicting feelings about money because we grow up steeped in a culture that reinforces all these different types of messages around it, especially for creative people. So you're being told, you know, oh, you've gotta be a success or else no one will take you seriously. Oh, but don't sell out. But oh, if you're gonna be an artist, you're gonna live in a cardboard box. But like, come on, what are you doing living in a cardboard box? This is America, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And it's just like, whatever pays you the most is supposed to be your job, I guess. But like, what if your job is something that doesn't really pay the bills, like comics? Um, it's, it's hard, it's hard. You, you need to pick a lane. Um, and you know, it's also, it's a struggle because people want to talk about money. You know, we catch ourselves all the time. I do it constantly. How many times have you been in a conversation with someone who says, and I mean, I got paid a reasonable amount for that job. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, okay. Um, and you know, oh, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty well off, I'm comfortable. Like, there are people who can sleep on beds of nails and that's comfortable for them. Maybe not comfortable for you, you know, like not, not one size fits all. Um, so I think that we're afraid of being judged, right? Even to the point where we don't talk about money in our own homes. Uh, this fact totally blew my mind. 43% of Americans do not know how much their spouse makes. What? Do, the person that you share a bed with, maybe if that's how you, what you're into, like I don't know. It's just, it's, boy. <laughs> Um, and you know, there, this is especially hard in creative fields. Oh, sorry, I missed, there's a reaction. Um, <laughs> that was my face when I found out. It was also my face when I found out that websites like Glassdoor exist, which is a place where you can just go look up how much an engineer makes at Google and it will tell you an average, like anonymized. That doesn't really exist, right? There's the Graphic Artist Skilled Ethical Pricing Handbook, but when you're just starting out, they're talking about, oh, if you sell a logo designed to a corporation and you charge them $80,000, and you're like, huh, what, $80,000? Like, no one's gonna pay me that. You have to talk to your peers, and if you wanna talk to your peers, you have to get comfortable talking about money, and it's awful. Um, however, there is hope, because
because I think the culture around this is changing. People are getting more candid. There are amazing threads on Twitter all the time from publishers, designers, uh, archivists. There was a great one. There was an archivists conference happening recently, and like all of these historical archivists were talking about how educated they were, where in the country they lived, and how much they were making as a starting salary, uh, either as a, a starting position or as like a senior archivist. And the numbers are just, they're wild, right? And I don't know about you, but often when I hear numbers like that, I don't jump to the thing that we're all afraid of. I don't cross my arms and think, wow, it must be nice to be really slim in it. Or I don't think like, oh geez, now I feel bad because I make too much money. It's, it's information, it's interesting. Somebody else's financial path doesn't have to be my financial path. And it's tricky because we're taught that one size is supposed to fit all and it just actually doesn't. So this is my uh, very smart friend, Lillian Karabayek. She runs um, a radio show called Oh My Dollar and uh, also does a lot of YouTube videos. She dresses up as David Bowie and then uses kittens and also glitter to explain budgeting and it's very helpful and also a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and she published a book called Get Your Money Together which I would highly recommend. Uh, it is probably the single most useful resource I have found for um, financial money management specifically for people with variable income which means a lot of creative freelancers because most budgeting books are like, let's say your salary is, and you're like, I'm oh, sorry, backup salary. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't know the meaning of the word. Um, so she has this thing that uh, has really stuck in my brain, that a budget, the way that you spend your money, is really just a system of values. Money is, is power, right? And how we choose to use our power is going to differ dramatically. It is very important to me to travel. It might be very important to you to send your kids to college. Who knows? Um, I definitely recommend going and getting the book because she expands on this concept and includes worksheets and stuff. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about kind of spun out of thinking about and on that note, I also read this amazing interview the other day on The Cut um, with Aminatu So, who's the co-host of a popular podcast called Call Your Girlfriend, which I don't listen to, but I love this interview. And she uh, was describing what it felt like to make $300,000 in a year and how she had spent her money. And she delineated this difference between how do you spend your money rather than how much money do you make. And it's that same thing, right? For her, she's sending money back to Africa to support her parents. And like that's something that hasn't occurred to me as a thing that I would do with my money, mostly because my parents are in California and they're mostly okay. Um, and I, I really just appreciated that she laid out all the different things she did, including like giving huge sums of it away to people. And someone who had that same chunk of money who was really interested in retiring at 47 might put all that money into investment, right? But she had a cancer diagnosis a couple years ago and now she says she just spends like she's gonna die any day because she might. And both of those avenues are completely legit. The point is there's no single correct way to finance a creative career. And whatever you find that works for you is going to be a mix of different things. So let's talk about what those might be. Um, there are various things that you will have in your corner uh, when you start out making creative work. So ideally, you have some ideas, right? You are a creator, maybe you have a book pitch you wanna sell, maybe you make art, um, maybe you just you know think that one day you might wanna write stories for a living. Then you can have a platform you can have social media expertise. Maybe you have networks even. Let's, let's take the social aspect of that off the internet and just say you are enmeshed in a community. Maybe you have an interest in business and logistics. That is not for everyone. There are plenty of cartoonists who um, just never want to touch the business side of the equation. As a self-publisher, I get very excited about spreadsheets, which is something that if you had told young me would happen, I was not a math kid, didn't like it, uh, it would be pretty surprising. You could have merchandise, maybe you don't want to make uh, books or someone else is making your books, but you just really love making weird little Velcro hand sewn whatever. That's good, there's room for that. Um, maybe you want to teach, maybe you like sharing the information that you've gleaned with other people. And maybe you just have like plain old job skills, not plain old job skills, I mean, all of those other things that I just described are actually a pretty good suite of job skills. And this is something I dread if I ever have to apply for a regular job. Um, that it's very hard to simultaneously say, look, I'm extremely qualified for whatever you want to throw at me. Also, I've effectively been unemployed for the last 10 years. <laughs> it's, it's tricky to know how to balance it. Um, but it's, it's good to remember that there are lots and lots of different avenues, and this is the thing that's worked best for me, is just having a, a finger in every pie. So here are uh, some things you can do to make money. You can freelance, you can get a publishing deal, you can have a day job, you can work on distribution, you can do consulting, you can do public speaking, digital publishing, merchandise, teaching, Patreon conventions, Kickstarter, online store, royalties, coaching, you get the idea. Um, I will point out specifically, con 
consulting and coaching. Um, because consulting is a magical word that I had never heard of until I started meeting people in the tech industry who fly around and get paid a lot of money to go talk to other people and tell them how to do their jobs without doing any of the actual work, and then they leave again, check. <laughs> that sounds pretty great to me. <laughs> um, and it's you know something that comes with experience over time. But even with coaching, like remember that your life experience, your expertise in your chosen creative field has value. Even though comics as an industry is a little broken when it comes to paying people a living wage, it doesn't mean there aren't other industries out there that will pay good money for the thing that you know how to do. Um, all right, so unfortunately the downside to spreading yourself across multiple different uh, arenas is that you end up making a lot of diagrams like this, uh, which I would draw in my notebook every couple of months. And this is actually misleading because there are only four lines coming off of this drawing, and in reality there are usually like 11. And I would be hunting down different invoices from different places and trying to follow up with clients. And at this stage in my career, it was, I actually found a letter I'd written to a friend that said just this. I said, God, I'm really so frustrated that I am uh, splitting myself between 15 tiny jobs right now. It's like $50 here, $200 there, $1,000 here, $75 there. And from all of those things, kind of making a career. And what I wish I could do is have three big things that create a stable ecosystem, like eating reasonable portions of different fruits and vegetables. <laughs> and, um, and miraculously, that letter was like, I don't know, six years old uh, when I found it and read it. That's kind of where I am, which is very exciting. It means things are going according to the plan that I didn't know I had. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about how we've gotten from this uh, to this, which is much more organized. This is what uh, an experiment that I tried last year where I set a financial goal for myself for the first time. Usually I've just kind of taken the money as it comes. And uh, I'll show you actually year by year how much I've made um, since 2014, a little later in the presentation. Um, but this was just an experiment to see. Uh, I came up with this number. $72,000 is a lot of money for me. Um, but it is how much I realized I needed to keep my business running and to support myself and actually save for retirement and not just live in this like paycheck to paycheck or pay, pay, payday to whatever. You get the idea. Um, and when I drew out all of these boxes, the idea was I would color in each chunk of $1,000 as I got it. And I don't know how, yeah, you can kind of read it. It's like you can see the chunks. That book, How to Invent Everything, was instrumental last year because you can see I got like eight grand to do all the illustrations for this book. It was amazing. It was also 56 very technical illustrations about how internal combustion engines work, and it was a nightmare. But um, it, was, it was really fun, and Ryan was a delight to work with. And that was new for me. I have never gotten paid that much to do a single illustration job. Industry publishing, it's different, right? You get paid to illustrate a book, it's a big chunk of change. But you can see there are some conventions in here, like the ECCCC is Emerald City Comic Con, which is usually a pretty lucrative show. But I was touring all this year, and this income was predicated on doing event after event after event after event and just hustling, hustling, hustling. And when I wrote it all out initially, I was like, I can't want $72,000, that's too much money. I'm not allowed to want that money. It is okay to want money. <laughs> We're taught that it's like blasé or gauche or rude to talk about money, to want money. Like it is okay to want to have enough to live your life comfortably. God, <laughs> it's so difficult to like, fight that stigma, especially in the arts. Um, you are not a sellout if you have enough to retire on. You're not a sellout if you have enough money to get on food stamps, which is what happened to me. And like that was the point where I thought, oh, this feels like success to me. Because I've been on government assistance for five years trying to make this happen. And I'm finally at a point where it's starting to build up to be something that I can live on. So I just want to drill that in just for any of you who are like facing this prospect. Maybe you have a day job and you're thinking of going freelance. Like, I don't know. Uh, it's just, it's okay. Get that paper. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about some specific examples. Uh, traditional publishing, I should point out, I'm leading with it because it's the one that I have the least experience with. I have actually never sold a book to a, a traditional publisher. Um, I got that agent in 2016 and then have befuddled the heck out of him for the last three years because I keep not giving him books to sell and making them on my own on Kickstarter instead. And every time he's like, wait, what? You, you can, <laughs> can you just let me sell a book? <laughs> And I know, as I'm saying this, that Ben has been one of the people who's uh, on my case the most about doing this, and I think Colleen's thing was very useful for me. I point this out because, you know, you can look at me and say, ah, established, published author, Lucy Bellwood. But, like, the reason I'm established and published is that I've just been making my own rules. And uh, that means no one can tell me I'm not good enough. And 
there is a reason that I like being independent because pitching to a publisher is like, well, they might reject me. And I know how to do a Kickstarter. I know I can get $40,000 out of a group of people. Thank you, publisher. I'm going to give the rest of the talk from down here. Uh, no. <laughs> um, so with traditional publishing, though, here is what I have gleaned from talking to other people in the industry. Many colleagues have been very gracious in sharing um, numbers with me. So advances, everyone here knows how, who doesn't know how advances work? Anyone? It's okay if you don't. Okay, so, so, so a publisher, if you get a book deal, um, gives you a chunk of money to make the book, and you have to earn out that advance, which means you have to sell enough copies of the book to recoup that cost, and then you start earning royalties on the back end. So there are pros and cons. If you get a large advance, you have a chunk of money to live off of while you make the book, uh, but it takes a long time to earn out and earn royalties. If you have a small advance, you earn out faster. Agents are really helpful for negotiating what percentage of royalties you're gonna get, how big the advance is, so on and so forth. Um, that is a part of business that I am happy to leave for the professionals. There are um, comics publishers and there are mainstream publishers. However, this line is blurring because many, many mainstream publishers are starting graphic novel divisions because we're in a very exciting time for comics in sort of global readership. Um, but that being said, keep in mind that comics as an industry is kind of broken. Uh, we pay people by the page a lot of the time for freelance comics work and uh, a, a really good page rate is like $200 a page, $300 a page. It takes me cumulatively from start to finish probably more than eight hours to draw a page. And when you break that down to an hourly rate, it gets depressing really fast, so let's not think about it. Um, <laughs> lots of mainstream publishers <laughs> are getting into graphic novels, we've talked about this. Just keep in mind that advances from comics publishers, especially smaller specialty houses, might be more modest, right? It could be as low as $500. Um, it could be a six-figure deal, but all of this is dependent on the strength of your pitch, the demand for the type of material that you're putting out in the market, your track record as a creator. I don't think that my independent publishing career has been a waste of time because I can come to a, to a mainstream publisher and say, listen, I sold 4,000 books on my own. Think about how many more books you could sell. You have a marketing team. I'm just one woman. Um, there's trade-offs there, right? No one is going to push your book as hard as you are. Uh, it's just kind of the sad fact of the world. But um, it's good to know how to do those things if you're interested in doing them down the line. So just to give you an average, because 500 to 200,000 is like a lot of um, Remember, I, I got paid a decent amount for that book. Um, or an indecent amount. That's what I want. So the average <laughs> starting advance um, for a graphic novel hovers around 25,000. Uh, Colleen kindly supplied the figure that it's more like 8 to 10 if you're the writer. Um, and sometimes you get an advance as a team and you have to split it, different things. Uh, good to point out that that number hasn't really gone up in the last 10 years, whereas the cost of living significantly has. Fun! Yay! Um, I should also point out that, okay, there's 25,000, right? Your agent usually takes a percentage, and then you should probably set aside about 30% for taxes. And then you've got to deal with cost of living, and a graphic novel takes, I don't know, anywhere from one to two years to draw. And suddenly, a big chunk of money has turned into a completely implausible sum to fully support your life. So it's just good to remember that advances are not going to solve all of your problems. Um, and it is a decent idea to have just some other irons in the fire. And th it's also good to remember that the, de the definition for visual narrative work right now is really broad. Um, there was a, a graphic memoir that came out recently that is just a collection of comics that this writer put on Instagram that were clip art illustrations of the heads of people in her family with like captions over the top. And it's the same drawings, but different captions. And initially I picked it up and I was like, this is not, this is not a graphic memoir. And then I slapped myself and was like, what are you talking about? It's all comics, it's all good. Uh, there are so many different types of books that use words and pictures. So if you are uh, excited to get into this world and you're like, I don't wanna draw a whole graphic novel, great news, you don't have to. You can do all different kinds of things. Okay. So that's the traditional publishing stuff. Now we're gonna talk about the stuff I really care about, which is the difference between capitalism and gift economies. And when we talk about social media, there is a part of putting stuff on the internet that really feels like giving your work away for free. It's something that's very scary to newer creators because we say, well, what if I put my idea online and somebody steals it? Or what if I put my idea online and then a publisher's already seen it and then they're not interested in it? So there are a couple ways we can look if I say, you can only read my comic if you pay for it first, that is capitalism, right? Um, I mean, I'm not proactively back there slapping your hand every time you try to open my book before paying it, but 
That's kind of the general theme of capitalism. However, if I say, here is my comic for free, you can go to 100demondialogues.com right now and read the whole book online. It will stay that way because I published this book and I make the rules. And I can say that's for you. It's, it's a gift. And then if you like that book, I would love it if you supported me in return. And I think that is a gift economy. I think that is, I am giving you something with the premonition that giving it to you, it's not entirely unself-interested. And that's okay. Remember, it's okay to want money. But it is a gift that I make of my work. And then that turns into a gift of financial support that my readers give to me. So there are about 380 people right now on uh, Patreon. Does everyone know what Patreon is? Anybody who doesn't? Patreon is a website that allows um, people, supporters, to give you money every month uh, for the work that you do, or every time you post a new installment of whatever it is that you make. So it's kind of a, it's the closest thing I've ever had to a paycheck. Uh, and it brings in about $1,800, $1,900 a month for me, which again is the closest thing I've ever had to a paycheck. It's changed my life. But it's not conditional, right? I put stuff out for free. Sometimes, eventually, people trickle down and decide to become patrons. Uh, I have 9,500 followers on Instagram, uh, another 9,500 on Twitter. 380 people have chosen to support me. So just, you know, <laughs> consider the funnel effect. It's, it's, you just have to talk to a lot of people because some of them will really want to support what you do. And when I was joking about people buying books after speakers have gotten up to present, like there's a reason that happens. When you invest in another person, in their personhood, it is more exciting to support them. So if, for example, I say, yes, you can absolutely buy my book on Amazon. However, uh, I only get four to five dollars per copy and I get paid nine months in advance, really love to be able to make rent next month, you could buy it from my store and I would make $11 and it would be paid out in two weeks. And that doesn't really mean as much when you read it on the internet, but if you talk to a person and you're like, oh, I met Lucy, I, I'm moderately invested in whether or not she starves to death, sure, I'll buy her book on this other website instead, why not? So the point is that gift economies allow for greater mobility. You are not strong-arming your audience into doing something. You are letting them choose. So people love choosing to do things, right? It feels I just uh, was forced to pay Apple 99 cents to upgrade my iCloud storage so that I could run this presentation, and I hated every second of it. I was like, no, I don't want, no, I don't want this, no, you're not fine, I'll buy it. Um, and that's so different from <laughs> giving somebody something and then letting them say, well, you know, I've used this free program for years. Or if you listen to a podcast you like, right, and the host is always saying, please leave us a review on iTunes, please do it, please do it. And one day you're like, God, I really do like this podcast, and I really care about this person, even though I've never met them. Weird. That's called a parasocial relationship. Uh, it's very common on the internet. Um, and then you leave them a review, finally. It takes so much effort just to do that simple thing. All right. So what's the deal with Kickstarter? Kickstarter is really great for funding discrete projects with clear parameters, like a book. Uh, ideally, it is a book you have already drawn. I don't know about you, again, for me, I get very stressed out if a bunch of people have given me money. This is also why mainstream publishing freaks me out, is like, every page I draw, I'm thinking like, this would better be a $25,000 page. Um, <laughs> whereas, again, if I'm under my own steam, I put myself under tons of pressure, sure, sure, whatever, but at least it's not this external pressure. So, usually for all my projects, I have finished drawing the book, and I go to Kickstarter to get financing to publish the book. It is generally best to have a following before you launch your Kickstarter. And I don't mean 9,000 followers on Twitter. I just mean have a community, have a network of people. It could be your relatives. My first campaign was mostly funded by swing dancers uh, because that was the community in Portland that I was a part of and people were you know, into helping me do my thing. Remember that your funds are taxable income. Much like with a book advance, uh, money you receive from Kickstarter is not a magic money hole that you just get to run off with a big sack with a dollar bill on it. It's like you have to pay taxes on it, it is income, et cetera, et cetera. Kickstarter takes a cut, other services take a cut. It is helpful to care about logistics or to hire somebody who does because it is going to be uh, a lot of work and you're gonna have to deal with spreadsheets and backers and shipping and production and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's also pretty time constrained. So you put a campaign up and you set a goal, you say I wanna raise my first one, I wanted to raise $1,500 uh, because I was in college and I, I was like, that's, a, that's more money than I can imagine. Um, and so when I raised nearly 12, it was like, ah! um, But it is good to have uh, a fairly low goal, right? The lowest goal you think you can reasonably fulfill your project with because everyone loves a success story. 
I was very worried that once I hit the gold, people would be like, great, that's the end of that, and they wouldn't care. But people kept giving, like a lot, far beyond, because they wanted the thing. It wasn't about funding the specific goal. It is a lot of work. Like, really, it is going to consume your entire life, and you will not be able to think about anything else for as long as it's running, and it's going to take about a year to do all the fulfillment. And actually, the thing that I used to say I didn't like about mainstream publishing, you finish, it takes years to do the book, right? And then you finish the book, and then you have to wait a whole year while the publisher does their job and gets the book ready and puts it out and puts it on the schedule. It actually has taken me about a year each time to put my own books out into the world. So like, hats off publishers. I guess your job is legit. Um, <laughs> I'll pitch my book, I'll do it, I'll do it. Uh, so these were just, just to see the numbers for each of these again. Um, started out, True Believer was a little 36 page book. Um, Baggy Wrinkles had a lot of stretch goals because it overfunded pretty significantly. So the book is in color because people on um, Kickstarter pledged extra money. Um, and then 100 Demon Dialogues was not a significant elite, if you notice. But all of these are about two to three years apart. And if you decide to make a go of like repeatedly using Kickstarter, it's good to keep in mind that you don't want to fatigue your audience, right? We've all pledged to nonprofit organizations that email us every week asking for money. And that's not a gift economy. That's, again, like, and I, the, the need is dire, right? I get it. But it's also, um, you have to time carefully when you give people things and when you ask them for things. And I think the stack of things you give them should be higher than the times that you ask them for money. So Patreon, uh, we'll go over this quickly. Again, donations received either per creation or per month. I set mine up very explicitly to function like a paycheck, so it is fund my life. Uh, when I first put the page up, I said, this is how much it costs me to pay for health insurance. These were my goals. Uh, this is how much my grocery bill is every month. This is my utilities bill. This is my rent. And I really wanted to make it clear that this page is designed to sustain me so I don't have to keep drawing where's the money Bellwood diagrams and I can just do the creative work. Um, it's not time constrained. You put up a page, it just sits up there. Uh, if you want to launch one today, you can. You don't have to tell anybody about it. You could just put it up there and change it over time. There's really no big issue with like completely revamping your page and changing things. It is a great place to share process work. Um, I know a lot of writers and artists. I should point out that a lot of social media does trend towards the visual, and I talk to a lot of writers who struggle with how do I um, share engaging process photos when it's just me at my laptop slamming my head on my keyboard day after day. Uh, and I think there is a lot to be said for um, sharing what you know, writing educational material, sharing drafts in progress. Uh, the writer that I would recommend all of you go out and follow on every platform right now is Nicole Deeker. Uh, D-I-E-K-E-R, I believe. Um, she is a friend of mine who uh, s has self-published a couple of novels that are wonderful, called The Biographies of Ordinary People. And uh, she also writes a lot. She used to run a site called The Billfold, which very sadly folded recently. <laughs> um, but she writes beautifully and vulnerably and openly about money and the creative process, uh, and particularly about pitching uh, shorter pieces to make a living if you're freelancing as a writer, but also just about, like, what it's all about, how we all, how we all do it. Um, so she's a great person to follow because she ran her first novel through Patreon and did an amazing job of it. Funds are still taxable. It is much less work, uh, unless you really want it to be more, in which case it can also completely consume your life. So set your parameters carefully, um, but you have a lot more control. You can just put a page up and say, I'm never gonna post here, give me five bucks. I'll, I'll keep making stuff on Twitter. <laughs> um, or you can build a little community there. You can talk to people. You can have live streams. You can do whatever. But the bottom line is that crowdfunding is all built on relationships, right? And uh, it is all about knitting your communities together, giving them a space to support not only you, but also each other. Provide a service. Like, give people a place to go. Okay. So now we're going to run really quickly through uh, some graphs. Again, who am I? Who did I become? Uh, <laughs> Here are five creators who very graciously shared percentage breakdowns. This isn't very scientific because the, the labels they provided were self-applied. Uh, Jeff Jocks runs a very popular long-running webcomic called Questionable Content uh, and primarily finances his website miraculously still through ads. 58% of his income comes from ads on his website, which was the way that webcomics worked back in the day, but like these days it's pretty rare. And I think this is a good example of how models that worked for the people that you admire when you're coming up in the industry may not work for you. In fact, it's very likely that they won't. So it's just good to remember that everybody has a different path. Again, coming back around. Uh, to that point, here's my friend Hope Nicholson. 
She runs an imprint called Bedside Press. She is a publisher. Now, Hope's graph actually looks a lot like mine. It's uh, divided roughly into thirds, right? And you've got a big chunk of uh, royalties. I also recognize that this green thing is very difficult to distinguish. I apologize. Uh, my commitment to visual unity is not doing me favors here. Um, but actual freelance writing, right? Royalties from existing projects, and then editing, speaking, and misc uh, goes into the corner. My friend James, who is a wonderful comics writer, uh, has a day job. Legit, right? Look at that. I would love to get 81% of my income from one place. That sounds great. Uh, online sales of the comic, 2%. Conventions, 17%. This, uh, all of these slides I should mention are from about three years ago, so I would be very curious to follow up and like talk to people about what's different. My studio mate Steve Lieber is a more traditional, works for the big two, does superhero comics. 90% of his income actually does come from drawing comics, which is pretty wild. He does monthly comics and gets paid by the page decently to do that. Decently. Uh, Steve has said publicly that if you talk to him on Twitter, he will DM you all of his page rates uh, and everything, all the numbers you could ever want. So just know that if you're ever curious, um, there are a lot of creators who have said, like, I can't post this publicly for negotiation reasons, but I am happy to talk about it with anyone who asks. And then 10% is sales, which is batty to me, because 49% of my income comes from sales. Like, what? Um, again, three years ago, uh, my graph this year looks a little different, but um, that is a really big chunk because I'm going to conventions and I'm vlogging stuff in my online store. Patreon, though, is creeping up, and I'm really excited about that because it's money that I don't have to do specific um, public speaking was about 11, uh, which also includes teaching, and then illustration jobs, and then actual comics jobs that I got paid for, 4%. So according to this chart, right, if the thing you get paid the most to do is your job, I'm not a cartoonist at all. I'm 4% of a cartoonist, which is silly. All right, you with me so far? This is a lot of talking, I know. It's like so much information, but I get so excited about this stuff. Uh, so here are some hard numbers. Ah, it's so scary, so terrifying. Oh, I'm uh, not actually that freaked out. Here are uh, all of my income and output numbers from 2012 to 2015. Um, and you can see the years that I did uh, Kickstarters. 2012, I was in college, I was not making $24,000 that year. And, you know, it's much less than that. Uh, and I, did, I wasn't tracking my business finances very closely in 2012. So those numbers are a little suspect. But um, by the time we get to 2016, I'm tracking this stuff very carefully. Uh, I use a service that used to be called Outright and got bought by GoDaddy, who are not a company I'm super into, but I'm kind of enmeshed in the system now, and so I don't want to give it up. But I uh, categorize all my business expenses there. And I think this is something that's really important to consider, because if you go back, you'll notice that in 2015, I had $25,000 left over uh, to live on, right? The net here is kind of my paycheck, which I forget. I tend to think that when people talk about a paycheck, they talk about the numbers on the top, if you say how much you make from your job. But that's not true. If you have a day job and you have a salary of 57,000, your job doesn't come along and say, hey, can you pony up 30 grand for business expenses? You gotta pay to run the business that employs you. Uh, but that's what it's like being a self-published independent person. So it's good for me to remember that even when I'm like, I had such a successful year, I brought in 57 grand. It's like, oh, I'm still living on 25K a year which is on the lower end of the, of the national spectrum. Um, but I also carry money over from year to year. So when I posted 2016 numbers, you'll notice that the income and expenses numbers are very close. <laughs> and people were like, wait, you profited? I can't do math, but like whatever that teeny tiny number is, what did you live on? How did you survive? And so this is where being frugal and saving and nest egg comes along because there will be some years where that biggest expense there, the COGS, is cost of goods sold which is the cost I put into manufacturing all the books that I was going to sell. And that was a lot of money, 20 grand. Uh, and it's good to remember that those expenses are, you know, they're gonna come along. There will be big years and small years, but it's not linear. Uh, your most successful financial year may come long before or after your least successful, or your, sorry, your least financially successful year may come after your most financially successful year. No guarantee that it's just going to keep going up and to the right. Um, this is 2018's numbers, which is a little bit more reasonable. So this was the year that I tracked my income, and I went on tour, and I did all those events. Um, and I actually am really proud of how this year turned out. This was me profiting from all of the books that I printed through that Kickstarter. So there were about 1,300 people who ordered books from the 100 Demon Dialogues campaign. 
and I printed about 4,000. There are probably 200 left, which I am insanely proud of. Uh, that to me is like, I feel very justified that I worked very hard last year, that those books are out in the world, where I want them to be. They don't do me any good if they're sitting at home. Um, I mean, they're nice to sit on, they're like soft, they've got a very nice matte finish. And like, but uh, yeah, there's a, there's a big thing of authors building like thrones out of their books, right, and sitting on them. Uh, but th this was like, oh, 44K a year to live on feels good. And I'm not, that's not money that I'm like bracing for impact because I know I have to print another book next year. It's like, I, I feel like I have a little breathing room. In 2018, eight years after I started drawing comics, I feel like I'm at a point where I can see the trajectory where this could become something that is more stable. Uh, sorry if you don't like insects. Um, this is supposed to be a gift. Yes. Um, so <laughs> I learned today, I thought water striders had a lot more legs than this. Um, and so I kept saying, oh, be like a water strider, you know, have a, a leg in different places so that you can maintain your surface tension and not slip under. Um, but it turns out they only have, I don't know, maybe two, three, uh, not as many as I thought. There's these little front and back protuberances. I don't have a lot of protuberances and uh, <laughs> then you will remain stable and successful as a freelancer. Um, anyway, <laughs> really at the end of the day, as I've said, it is all about creating a balance between different financial funding and I believe at the point a lot that it's about what makes sense for you, um, but it's also important to remember that it's what makes sense for you right now, at this time and place in your life. And that is going to change for the rest of your life. And we're gonna talk about this more when we talk about success. That uh, there are many life events that will happen that will radically alter your priorities. There are unforeseen things that will take place uh, you might just grow and change as a person, and maybe you go from being super obsessed with selling a million copies to suddenly really wanting to like release an eight volume Golden's Roman about, I don't know, rats or something. It's like, there are options. Um, it will perpetually feel like this, uh, <laughs> which is my favorite gift. There are gonna be years where you're like, yeah, no, no! <laughs> um, so that is uh, my takeaway, and I realize we left a scant uh, five minutes for questions, but thank you for putting up with uh, a lot of information. I hope this has been helpful and illuminating. And I really encourage you to be brave with one another and just share, if there are things you've been curious about, you know there are people in this room who have gotten book deals or who have used Kickstarter or somehow seem to be making it all work, especially the people that you think they've got it all figured out, give each other space to talk about what it feels like to look like you have it all figured out and to actually maybe not have it all figured out because I don't think any of us really do. Um, so that's me, thank you. <laughs>